بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وموالا رب يسر ولا تعسر وتمم بالخير وبك نستعين يا فتاح رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحد وقتة من لساني يفقه قولي رب زدني علم والهقني بالصالحين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم سبحانك لا فهم لنا إلا ما فهمتنا إنك أنت الجواد الكريم So my dear brothers and sisters in Islam I cannot emphasize more how important this discussion is and how important it is for us as a nation of Muslims to engage in this topic and dialogue on this topic. Why so? That is my hopes today to allow you to understand the gravity of the matter and the significance and importance of addressing this. So inshallah, uh, as I said to uh, our dear brother Jazz, that this is a presentation that I do across the country. I did it last in August. Actually, I did it last in August in Chicago at the Parliament of the World's Religions. It is something that people around the world want to know more and they want to explore the understanding of it. To give you the short and sweet of it, Alhamdulillah, I was born and raised in Canada. I studied in England and Alhamdulillah, I graduated in the year 2000 with a master's in Islamic sciences. I became an Imam in America in 2002 and I've been serving in America, Alhamdulillah, for the last 22 years. The interesting thing was that I was an Imam for 13 years in Florida and remember this is all post 9-11. And what turned me off from continuing my job was the need to address this the need to address the core matter that was being used against us. Our religion is being weaponized and used against us from two powers that I'm going to talk about shortly. And you, your family, your children, your businesses are suffering because of it. And so in 2015, I stopped being an Imam and I started traveling the country to universities and churches and different places to do this presentation and to explain to the people what Sharia is. And before I move forward, I want you to ask, I want you to answer yourself the following question. Do you believe in Sharia? Don't nod yes or no. Do you believe in Sharia law? If a non-Muslim was to come up to you right now and ask you point blank, do you believe in Sharia? What would be your answer? And second, aside from what your answer would be, how confident would you be in your answer? I know many Muslims who are like, yes? They don't know. Are they saying yes or no? They don't know. Why? Because we as an ummah lack the comprehension of this very important topic. Now look, the failure is not on you. The failure is also on the scholars who have failed to make it, I don't want to say water it down, to make it explanatory to the people, to make it easy enough that it's palatable to the people. So inshallah, that being said, let's move forward, bismillah. First thing we want to do is make the case. Everything that you want to discuss and learn about, it's imperative to understand why you're learning it and what's the value added behind it. So here we're going to make the case. There are two threats facing Islam and the world at large as a result. Again, we have been facing a threat from two angles, two threats, constantly and continuously from even before 9-11. And that threat continues to exist. It continues to get stronger. It continues to amplify. The first of the two is what, everyone? Could you say that, please? I didn't hear you all. You're going to be talking tonight. What's the first threat? Islamophobia. You've heard that word? Islamophobia. Islamophobia, what is it? Islamophobia is presenting hatred of Islam and Muslims. How? 
not by some theory or concept from the outside, but using the religion itself to prove that the religion is bad. There are so many cases in our world today that it's hard to keep up with the news. From the guy burning the Quran in Sweden, to things happening in India, to England, to America, in Canada. For context sake, I hope I could use my... Use this. For context sake, everyone, can you tell me what that number is right there? $1.5 billion industry, the Islamophobia industry in North America is $1.5 billion. That's North America. I haven't gone to Europe yet. I haven't gone to Africa yet. I haven't gone to Australia yet. There is an industry in the work. You understand an industry. It's producing something. What is this industry producing? Hate for Muslims and Islam. How are they producing it? They're fermenting hate in the media, in the news, in commercials, in uh, Netflix series, to governments who lobby the government and those in Congress. They are spending how much money, everyone? You know, the sad thing is, we have care. They react and respond to problems, yes? That's our goal. Someone does something, Allah forbid, in Austin, care will be here tonight. We condemn this. This is wrong. Yes? Good. And then what will Muslims do? Oh, let's give money. We have this problem. We need to solve this. But proactively, how many of us are spending a percent of that? One percent to actually combat Islamophobia. They're spending $1.5 billion. We can't even get a million dollars to address that. You see, so long Islam and Muslims are working in a reactive way, we're always gonna be the underdogs. We're always gonna be dominated by the people who tell our story. The story is you're a terrorist. The story is you're out to bomb America. The story is your children are going to impose Sharia law and make every woman in America wear a burqa. This is the narrative being driven with what money? $1.5 billion in North America. So this is our first threat. Everyone's with us on that? You're good on the first threat? Now the second threat, again, what are we doing here? Making the case why, is, why Sharia is something that we all should talk about. The second threat is, what is it everyone? You know when people say Islamic extremism or Islamists? Extremism has nothing to do with Islam. There's no ifrat, there's no tafrit. We're, we're in the middle. We're not left wing, we're not right wing. So I hate saying Islamic extremist. I say extremism in the name of Islam. Till today, Al-Qaeda is around. Till today, ISIS is around. Till today, all the rogue groups that are constantly using the Quran as a tool to spread fear and hatred, they're around. Have you seen these people stop? No, they're everywhere. And their extremist ideology is seeping into Europe and into America. And the hopes is to make people so mad of how Muslims are being treated that they'll jump on a plane and go to Syria and join ISIS. Do you know how many non-Muslims and Muslims have tried to join ISIS? There was a documentary about a Christian girl, I think in Alabama, who was straight A student going to university to become a doctor and she got indoctrinated by ISIS on Twitter and she got apprehended by the FBI in Germany as she was transiting to go to Syria. So at one part of the equation, one side, your religion is under threat through Islamophobia. Through extremism, your children are under threat. Are you all with me in this? Does that suffice for making the case of why it's important to understand Sharia? Not yet? Let me explain to you then. 
What do these two people do? The Islamophobes and the extremists have one thing, have something in common. You see, the Islamophobes misinterpret the Quran. Are you all with me? Islamophobes take the Quran and Hadith and misinterpret it. Oh, your religion says to do this. Do you have an answer to that? No, we don't. We're like, well, maybe that is what my religion is. And the extremists misrepresent Islam. And they both share a common link. Could someone tell me what that link is? What's the link? What are they, what are they both, what do they both have in common? Sharia. The Islamophobes are misrep misinterpreting Sharia and the extremists are misrepresenting Sharia. Does that make sense? Is that sufficient for you to sit and learn what Sharia is? Yes or no? Because I promise you by Allah, until we're able to confidently write our narrative, Fox News and all the other pundits are going to speak for us. And truth is, I'm not even talking about the presidential election. Hard times are coming for Muslims in America. You have to be ready for it. And if you don't have a common understanding of who you are and what you are, then one by one we're going down. And that is why I feel the need to explain what Everyone's good with that, inshallah? You're good? You're satisfied? The case is made. We move forward. This presentation is a very lengthy presentation, and I'm not going to do it all tonight. It takes anywhere between two and a half to four hours because it's not a small topic. However, tonight we're going to cover part one, which is an introduction, and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open our hearts and minds to comprehend what will be said. Ameen Rabbil Alameen. Inshallah, in subsequent months, we'll talk about the penal law, women's rights, jihad, and I'll hopefully conclude with that. So, what is Sharia? To you, to me, everyone has a different thought of Sharia. There are many Muslims who say, I don't follow Sharia. There are Muslims who say, I don't believe in Sharia law. Is this kufr? Or is it not? Well, if you don't know what you're denouncing and rejecting, it could possibly be. So let's learn from the bottom up today, inshallah. The definition of Sharia, shara, like in the Arabic meaning, Sharia, shara means to show. Ibn Abbas radiallahu explained Sharia as a way of life. The scholars define Sharia as the path shown by Allah to his servants. The path shown by Allah to all of his servants. And what is that path, everyone? Islam. Inna deena indallahim Islam. The religion, the way of life Allah presented from Abraham to Moses to Jesus to Muhammad وسلم, and peace be upon all of them is Islam. Sharia is the way of life, the entirety of what Allah presents. Are you all good with that? Now, what is the objective of the lifestyle presented by Allah? The objective is to reform each person in the society so that they can be a benefit to their society and not a source of harm. Where was Mecca before Muhammad Sallallahu Nubuwa? Where was it? They were harming each other. They were killing each other. Why? Because they didn't have a way of life of doing good. Sharia makes you productive in a society so you can help your society. Why are we supposed to help our society? When Allah said to the angels, for this earth I'm making my representative. What is the job of us as Khalifas of Allah on this earth? Take care of the earth. Where does that care start from? From our homes our families, our community, and our society. So we have to be productive in society. Another objective of Sharia is to ensure justice is established for all humans and to establish the well-being for all communities. 
When the Rasulullah Sallallahu was in Medina, the Jews, the pagans, and the Muslims had established goodness for all. No one was under pressure, no one was being threatened. And lastly, what is the vision of Sharia? What does Sharia, the deen of Allah, Islam, want from us? Allah wants us to see an environment of safety, security, and social stability. I want you all to answer me. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't hear you all. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's an excellent thing, right? And number two, an atmosphere where everyone can thrive and reach their utmost potential. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? So do you believe in Sharia? Yes. There's nothing wrong with it. But so long someone continues to bombard you and make you feel otherwise, you're going to start rejecting it. So far, we have not heard anything which is alarming or that raises a red flag. So, to put this in a nutshell, because remember, bringing it down to third grader level so everyone can understand it, look at this here. Sharia is divine legislation. Everyone's okay with that? Allah said, live like this. Who said it? Allah. When Taylor Swift or Justin Bieber or LeBron James says live like this or Messi says live like this, people do it. Yes or no? How they dress, how they eat, how they talk, what they do. Everyone presents a life. Allah, the Creator, is presenting a life. So divine legislation is known as Sharia. Islam is practicing Sharia and Iman is the prerequisite for the acceptance from Allah. You know how people sometimes say, oh, that person is so honest, I wish they were Muslim. That person is so generous, I wish they were Muslim. Their generosity is good, but they don't get the rewards in the Akhirah because if you want the rewards, you have to be a believer. So it's like if I want money uh, from Amazon, I need to work for Amazon to get paid, right? If I go to Amazon's uh, you know, their, what you call it, their offices, and I sweep up every week and I say, hey, give me money. They'll say, thank you for sweeping up, but we haven't employed you. So people will do good things in life, but faith is a prerequisite. Islam is a practice, and Sharia is the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everyone's good so far? Yes, we're good? Okay. So now we all should understand that Muslims across the world follow their Sharia just as you follow your Sharia. We all follow Sharia. Can you say that? I follow Sharia. I know you feel a bit scared because, oh my God, is that FBI going to come to a morning and knock my door? You follow Sharia? We're going to explain it. Allah says it in the Quran. Shara'a lakum min ad ma wasabihi nuha. Who is Nuh السلام, The first prophet to warn the people. إليك, who is Ilaik? Rasulullah, everyone. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. From Nuh السلام, to Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi Three of the great prophets. The legislation of life was given from Nuh السلام, to Rasulullah. That is Allah telling us the divine legislation and way of life has been given to all people across the ages from all the prophets. So, is there evidence for our Sharia in the Quran? This is one of them. Moving on. Now, the sad part is Islam has been demonized. And that is because Muslims have been demonized. And according to a study in 2018, two in five Americans felt Islam was incompatible with US values. Do you know what this means now? I want you to hear me very clearly because you may say, well, guess what? We're in America. We're not in Pakistan or Saudi Arabia where everyone follows Sharia. That's ignorant speaking. You follow Sharia in America as they would follow their Sharia in Pakistan. It's not like, oh, I don't need to learn it because I'm not living there. If you don't understand that almost half of Americans don't feel your religion fits, that means you don't fit. That means your children don't fit. 
That means you have no future in this country for the long haul. Do you understand? If in a regular study, almost half of America says, nope, you guys, what you believe is a problem, that means you're a problem, and that means your continuity in America may one day be a problem. And don't think for a second, oh, that was history. What happened to the Japanese? What happened to, what happened to the Koreans? What happened to the African Americans? That's history. History repeats itself. You understand? Okay, so we move on. As of the presentation I did in the Parliament of the World Religion, and I've done it after that too, but just for the context sake, at that time in August, the world population was a little over 8 billion. The Muslim population was a little over 2 billion, which makes the Muslim population of the world how much, everyone? How much? What's our population right now, guys? We are almost 25% of the global population. That means if there is 25% of the world that follows Sharia and the world is putting you down because of what you follow, 25% of the world is at threat. What's the answer? What's the answer? You keep responding to every mosque burning and every girl's hijab being pulled and every boy, in this, a Muslim boy being bullied or in, in a protest in university in America. It's only going to get worse because 25% is a large number. Do you agree, yes or no? That's why the only thing you can do is educate yourself. Pew Research Center reported that Islam is the fastest growing religion, religious group in the world compared to any other religion. Hence, everyone should understand the Sharia Muslims believe in. Again, doubling down with different statistics to show. Now, there's two parts of Sharia that you need to know. Sharia is the entire lifestyle of Islam. Everyone's with me? The entire lifestyle of Islam is what, everyone? Sharia. One is the personal devotional law. How you live your life, how you pray. Do you do rafia dayn? Do you put your hands here? Or this is your sharia, you practice, it's fine, right? Personal devotion. There's no qadi or judge needed to come and tell you if you're right or wrong. But then there's the state sanction law, which a judge in a Muslim country will decide when it comes to what we call the cutting of hands or the chopping of heads, right? There is called state sanction law, which we do not practice in America. Do we practice in America this? Why? Why aren't you chopping hands off after Juma prayer, brother? I'm asking you. <laughs> Why aren't you chopping hands off? Why? Huh? Oh, you don't have the stick. Brother, Amazon.com. Google sword, <laughs> bring a sword. Why? Because this country runs under the constitution, has its own laws. You don't bring your laws to a country that has laws. Are you with me? But this, your personal devotional law, every Muslim from Fiji to the Maldives, to Alabama, to Iowa, practices their own Sharia. It doesn't mean just because you believe this and you don't practice this that you can say, because of this, I don't believe in Sharia. No, Sharia is the entire package. Everyone's with me? Entire package. Sharia law, now we're going into Sharia law, was the state system of the Islamic Caliphate. So long Islamic Caliphate governing body ruled in parts of the world, Sharia law, remember, we're talking Sharia law now, was practiced from the time of the departure of Rasulullah to around 101 years ago, 102 years ago. Everyone's with me on this? So for the majority of time on this earth, for the last, well, since Muhammad for the last 1290, to update that number, 1291 years, Sharia was practiced in the world. Where was it practiced? Well, before people throw fits like, oh my God, Sharia is coming to take over. These different colors show the expansion of Islamic rule, hence Sharia law, in these parts of the world. As you see, it didn't penetrate the entirety of Africa. It didn't penetrate into the depths of Asia. It didn't go down up here. 
But you see, it also didn't go into the heart of Europe. But Sharia was existent in Arabia, North Africa, uh, in, in, in northern parts of Arabia, moving into uh, Bosnia, Albania, Turkey, and of course this way uh, towards India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and this area. So over the course of centuries, Islam spread and the law preferred for the people was the Sharia law. Now, people call that the Dark Ages. During that time, Muslims were barbaric and backwards and everything was wrong and everything was going out of control. But if you look at history from an unbiased perspective, Europe was in the Dark Ages. Islam was in the Golden Ages. Now, what were some, and again, I don't like, you know, people have those 1001 advancements of Islam from toothbrush to heart surgery to cataract surgery to stitches from cat gut to coffee. Everyone loves their coffee. Muslims gave you coffee. Well, we're not going to go into those things. But if you look at the foundational level, education was rooted in every single aspect where Sharia law was present. From the Zaytuna University in Tunisia, the House of Wisdom in Baghdad, the Qarwiyin University in uh, Morocco. Uh, SubhanAllah, Fas is beautiful. Till today, I went to Morocco 20 years ago. And SubhanAllah, I continue to dream of Fas. Fas, you could smell knowledge in Fas. And a female by the name of Fatima al-Fahri opened a university that's still functioning today. And subhanAllah, I have to tell you that if you had a dictator in Sharia, a Khalifa who was a dictator, the last thing they want is for you to be educated. Because what an autocrat and a dictator fears is your brain. If you are educated, you'll be able to call them out for their wrongs. But Sharia wasn't a control, it wasn't domination, it wasn't an autocracy. And that's why education was everywhere. In addition to that, science and technology, uh, the first person to fly was Abbas ibn Firnas. Ibn Sina wrote the canon of medicine. Ibn Hayyam was, uh, wrote the book of optics and the father of scientific method. So you see also a lot of what we're learning today in the West is rooted in Islam. Architecture. If you believe that Sharia and Islam was spread by the sword and it destroyed every civilization, go to Iran, go to Arabia, and you'll see beautiful architecture, which was a presentation of what people had in themselves. They were so enriched with qualities and talents, and Sharia law gave them the ability to thrive and to succeed, that they made things that we go back home and we are in awe. Look at these masjids, subhanAllah, made by hand, right? And of course, one of the most important things people forget, Islam presented through Sharia an inclusive society, where Muslims, Jews, Christians, and everyone else live together. Islam didn't come and say, we're only going to do one way. I remember when I was in Amman, Jordan, back in the 90s, and I saw a mosque, a church, and a masjid within the same street. And I understood that Islam had an understanding that we were not about domination and taking over. It was about sharing the world, but also leading the world with what we knew and what we were able to present. And that's why the House of Wisdom, the most beautiful part was House of Wisdom, where Muslims, Jews, and Christians came together and they not only attended the learning sessions, but they taught one another. So again, you'll see in the history of the Caliphate where Sharia was practiced and Sharia law was the law of the land, people were only thriving. Do you think it was the Golden Ages or the Dark Ages? What do you guys think? Golden? So I think we're on the same page. Now, where does Sharia come from? Sharia is a scale of sources. There are divine sources and there's human sources. The beautiful balance Allah has given. The first is what, everyone? The Qur'an. The first source of Sharia is the Qur'an. I don't think I need to say more. The second is the Hadith, the words and the actions of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The third usul of Shara is the consensus of scholars known as Ijma' where Islamic scholars mutually agree on the legality of an issue for which there is no explicit ruling 
in either of the two divine sources. Is this, is, is this in hadith? Is this in hadith, yes or no? Is this in Quran, yes or no? Is it halal to use a phone, yes or no? Is it halal? Yes. How is it halal? Ulama and scholars discuss the purpose of this, the legality of the legitimacy of it, and through the values imparted in the Quran and the Hadith, the scholars make ijma. Make sense? And the last one is known as qiyas or juristic analogy, where a logical deduction is made, again, from a scholar based on something which needs like an immediate answer. For example, you're in a plane and you're flying and you want to pray but they told you cannot stand up and pray and you cannot congregate and the qibla is the opposite direction how do you pray again wherever you are you'll sit and you'll make your wudu or tayammum and you'll pray so again these are the four sources the quran and hadith will not change do you agree with me but since our world is fluid and our sharia is fluid we need scholars uh, the collective scholars and the individual scholars to help bring the Quran and Hadith in context. So it's not Allah said it and done deal, okay? Or we say what we want and done deal. Because there are those Muslims today who say, take out the word jihad and for marriages and all this from the Quran because it's barbaric and then it will be better religion. No, it won't. You have to understand the whole picture, not a part of the picture. So everyone's got the sources of Sharia. Everyone's good so far. Not too overwhelming. We'll be finishing very soon. Again, I don't want to overwhelm everyone. There's a lot to discuss, but we want to get the introduction done today. So moving on. Let's break down the Quran by numbers because Quran is the main source, right? Quran is the first source. I can't go into the Ahadith. There's hundreds of thousands. I don't have time. You don't have time. But let's go to the Quran. What does the Quran consist of? So the Quran has how many verses, everyone? How many verses does the Quran have? Well, that's much better because that was too loud. How many verses does the Quran have, everyone? Can you tell me, sisters and brothers? 6,236 verses. Okay, everyone's good with that? 22% of the Quran is about belief, Iman. Iman is essential. Remember, you have to believe before you do. And you have to believe and do so you can get the rewards, right? So Iman is 22% of the Quran. 14% of the Quran consists about community, how to engage in community, what is community, what does Ummah look like, for example. 13% is about character, morals and values or demeanor. 11% of the Quran is stories. With qala Ibrahim li abihi azara, with qala Musa li qawmi, 11%. 11% is teachings, 11% is admonitions, 11% is affirmation, what to do, what not to do. Everyone's good? So how far are we so far? Could everyone put the numbers together? 22 plus 14 is what? Ajazbek, come on, we need numbers here. Who's got, who knows how to do math? Come on, everyone. 22 and 14 is what? 36. 36 plus 13 is 49. 49 plus 11 is? 60 plus 33 is 71, 82, 93. So this is 93% of the Quran. Is anything bad here? Anything alarming here? Anything scary here? We're looking good? Huh? We're looking good? How much is left? 7%. 7% of the Quran is law. Your book is a threat to American, America's existence to the West existence. Why do you think people are burning the Quran? Did you ever ask yourself that question? Why are people burning the Quran? Because they believe the entire Quran is a threat to their existence. But for 93% of the Quran, was there a problem according to them? Nothing. But the 7% is a problem, but that's not even a problem. Let's go to the 7% and break it down. 7% of the Quran is around 434, 37 verses. It addresses law or legal issues. I'm going to go slowly so you don't get overwhelmed. 65% of the 7%. We're talking about 7% of the Quran, okay? Everyone's with me? 7. 
Forget the 93 now. From the 7% of the Quran, 65% are about personal custom and devotion. How you pray, how you fast, you know those things, personal things. These are non-judicial issues. You don't go to court for these things, okay? You don't go to court for these things. Prayer, purity, fasting, pilgrimage, food, drink, oaths. You don't go to, you don't go to court for this. Everyone's okay? So 65% of 437 is not even a problem. 30%, 65 and 30 is what? How much? 95. This 30% is transactional and family. Write down your contracts. Fulfill your contracts. So 30% is about transactional and family. Contracts, partnerships, endowments, probate, custody, marriage, and divorce. These are judicial issues, but they're important, right? If a marriage is on the rock, someone's getting divorced is a problem, go to the court, go to the judge and solve it. So is this a problem so far? Is this a problem so far? We've covered 95% of the 7% of Quran. So where's the problem? 5%. 5% of the 7% of the Quran talks about education, penal code, or international relations about war and stuff. Meaning, meaning, meaning what? You know the chopping the hands and cutting off the heads and stuff? It equates to 0.35% of the entire Quran. How many verses, everyone? Did you know 22 verses have hijacked your religion? And you know how shameful it is? Shameful. I'm sorry, I'm going to be blunt. Shame on you and shame on me. That this rhetoric was used to prop up ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, who is sitting in a cave, sending VHS videos down the cave, in Tora, Bora, wherever else, and CNN, NBC, BBC, and the whole world is showing his video. And you and I could not say he's wrong. With one voice, we couldn't say this is not Islam. You know what happened in Canada after 9-11? The same week of 9-11, the police stopped a Sikh. Does anyone know who was a Sikh? Anyone tell me who was a Sikh? Who is sick? Yes, sir. They wear turbans, yes? They're, they're, we say Sikh, they're sick. The name is actually sick. But in America, you know how they say Muslims? They don't say Muslims, they say Muslims, right? So we say Sikhs. Their leader is Guru Nanak. And Guru Nanak is their peer or their leader who apparently went to Hajj. Which means he may have been a Muslim. Must have been a Muslim. Right? Anyways, the police stopped him in Canada, took him out of the car, and they body slammed him on the hood of the car. Anyone watch WWF? Now it's WWE, remember? Body slams? Picked them up and threw him down. That same day, 506 gathered right away outside the police station. And by that evening, the police officer, the police chief was fired. That evening, heated time right after 9-11, and they made the whole world understand, hey, we're not Muslims. We wear turbans, we're not Muslims. Come, we'll teach you what our religion is. Today, an American knows a Hindu from a Sikh and a Sikh from a Muslim, but an American doesn't know who a Muslim is. Look, you can do open house your whole life. This is what Islam is. Look how beautiful our masjid is. Look at our carpet, our chandelier, mashallah. We're peace-loving people. There's no swords. There's no death to America. We're nice people, right? They don't care about that. They don't care about your buildings. They care about you. Can you explain who you are? And since 9-11, we have not explained who we are. And you know what? the $1.5 billion industry of Islamophobia in North America is on? 22 verses. Shame on us. Allah guide us. Ameen. So, we're going to stop here. Why? Because I want to hear your thoughts and question. The next topic is penal law and it is very deep. We're going to go into honor killings and everything else, but it's heavy. 
But I want you to understand there are hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, for example, that talks about a lady that came to him and she was bruised up because her husband beat her the night before. And the Prophet sallallahu said something, but he didn't address why she was beaten. And that hadith is now taken out of context to say that the Prophet welcomed and accepted her being beaten when Imam Bukhari has placed it in a chapter known as the permissibility of wearing green. She was wearing green and the hadith was quoted just that portion in that place, in that chapter to prove that green was worn and the Prophet didn't say anything. The point is people are taking our religion and they're being indoctrinated how to take it out of context. In Iowa, one of the, sorry, in Idaho, one of the many states where Sharia law ban was pushed. You hear about that? Sharia law ban? You never heard of that, anyone? Almost every state in America pushed for a bill to be passed called the Sharia law ban that Muslims are practicing Sharia and we need to ban it because your religion is a threat to America. When in actuality, according to the Constitution, no other law but the Constitution can be followed. But why were they pushing for this ban? They're pushing it because they wanted to put you in a corner believing you're so bad that you if not you, your daughter, if not your daughter, your son will leave Islam because they hate it. And you know what? Sharia law was practiced in Texas until it was banned. But in one context, for marriage, for divorce, for custody, for inheritance. Matter of fact, even the Halakha law, you know what the Halakha law is? The Jewish law, the Jewish Sharia was practiced in America for the same reasons, not chopping off hands or chopping off necks. That is why in Texas, it passed, I think, the first or second time. It didn't pass, I think, the first year, the second year, it passed with flying colors. Sharia ban. Muslims are bad. Sharia is bad. Here in Austin, where you're sitting and living, where you're raising your families and your children, here in the state capital, a bill was passed years ago banning your religion when your religion wasn't doing anything wrong to this world. In Florida, when I was living in Florida, this bill was proposed three times, three years. It failed, it failed, it failed. But do you know why it failed? Because the Jews pumped money to make sure it failed. Again, the Jews, the Jewish community pumped money to make sure it failed. Now you say, well, the Jews are our enemies. We're too emotional. The Jews knew that if Sharia law is banned, then their law is also banned. In France, circumcision and halal food is now banned. Halal food is banned. It's coming to America, just wait. It's coming. The Jews do circumcision, the Muslims do circumcision. Tomorrow, the hospitals will treat it like they're treating abortion in Texas, unlawful. And at that time, don't go crying to care and say, care, fight this. The groundwork is being made to legitimize those positions. Groundwork is being made to legitimize those positions. And so the reason the Jews lobbied and fought against this bill is because if our religious rights go, their religious rights will go also. So on the fourth year, you know what they proposed? What bill? Anti-foreign law bill. That any law outside of America should be banned, but guess what? That's already banned through the Constitution and it passed with flying colors. So now in Florida, in Texas, and many other states across America, Sharia law is banned. 
That means tomorrow, Allah forbid, Allah forbid. They say there's no land left and we have to burn your bodies because we can't bury your bodies. You can't say my religion doesn't allow us to burn. We don't care. Tomorrow when you say we have to eat halal and we have to circumcise our, our boys and we have to do X, Y, and Z, we don't care. Because Muslims failed in the last 22 plus years to understand 22 verses. They study your Quran and Hadith more better than you study it. Please don't say, I don't have time. I'm not asking you to study the the Siha, the Sitta, Muslim, and Abu Dawud, and Nasa'i, and Bukhari. I'm not asking you. I'm not asking you to sit down and listen to a podcast of Sira or, or YouTube videos of the Tafsir. I'm asking you to understand who you are and what you believe because we can stand firm as one body. But we didn't. When I did this presentation in Boise, Idaho, at the Church of the Cathedral of the Rockies, where they were trying to pass that bill. They flew me in. I did a presentation, three and a half hours. Elected officials were there, teachers, everyone else. And alhamdulillah, thum alhamdulillah, that bill failed. Because we stood together to do proactive, not reactive. I've gone six minutes above, and I'm gonna stop here. But I hope we started something. You all agree, inshallah? There's more to discuss. Talk about this with your families and your children. And inshallah, when we get a chance, and I get a chance, I'll come back again. And inshallah, we'll cover the penal law. And inshallah, if possible, we'll also cover, um, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, we had penal law and women's rights. If Allah gives us a chance, inshallah, we'll do the penal law, women's rights, and then we'll come back for jihad in the conclusion. Does that sound right? But remember, your religion is beautiful. There's nothing bad in your religion. What's bad is my ignorance about my religion. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to understand Islam, to appreciate Islam, to be better Muslims, to be positive uh, citizens of this country and this world. May Allah allow us to bring positive change in a time of darkness. May Allah allow us to be the beacon of light in places of darkness. May Allah allow us to represent the best of the best of Islam and be the representatives of Muhammad and Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Ameen ya rabbal alameen. Jazakumullah khairan to all of you. Imamana, thank you so much for everything and inshallah we look forward to seeing you all in the morning at Fajr inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.